Well, I've done the maths and it seems like there's 8,800 tonnes of spent fuel at the site or maybe rounded off to 10,000 tonnes of spent fuel at just that site at the Fukushima Daiichi reactor complex and that has included spent fuel pools at units 5 and 6. So I wonder how much spent fuel uh, Japan has in toto, Arnie Gunderson. Oh, I don't know, Helen. They're all old plants. And, uh, you know, some like Tokai only have two units and, and Anagawa has three. So they, they vary. But I'm sure you can, there's 50 reactors, and I'm sure you can say at least 600 bundles for each reactor, perhaps more. So that's 600 tons per reactor times 50 reactors. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a big number. Um, uh, so 30,000 yeah. tons. Um, yeah, that's, okay. That's well, a minimum. Yeah. Yeah. Minimum, more. Now, yeah. Yeah. Now, the beauty of Unit 4 is that there's nothing in the nuclear reactor. So the, the, as they go up, as you go to 1, 2, and 3, of course, you've got to empty the fuel pools and... That's not clear, especially Unit 3, how much damage is in the fuel pool. I think the damage in Unit 3's pool is extensive. But then you've got to get in the nuclear reactors on 1, 2, and 3. And, of course, the fuel is melted down there, so it's not as simple as grabbing the bundles and, and lifting them out. The, um, the fuel is actually you know, melted, and there's a blob on the bottom of the reactor if you're lucky, and, in fact, more likely has leaked through the reactor, and there's a blob on the concrete. So it's uh, um, they're going to be much more difficult than Unit 4. Well, I mean, the only time they've ever tried to remove melted fuel was at Three Mile Island, and that took them 10 years, didn't it? Um, yes. And but that, that, was but easy. that wasn't really melted like the way these three mm. have really... Right. Re that way, TMI had um, a blob of nuclear fuel on the bottom, but it hadn't breached the vessel. Uh, all of these vessels have been breached. The control rods come in at the bottom, and they're leaking like a sieve. Um, so what fuel, uh, it, it is likely that fuel has oozed out through the control rods. If not burned its way right out, uh, it's, it's likely Unit 2 is, has burned its way right out and is now lying on the concrete. So, um, And I think that's really the, the big change in my uh, view of the problem is... Um, is what they're finding in units one, two, and three now. Wow. The um, you got so let's think of the nuclear reactor as a pressure cooker. Okay. And the nuclear reactor is in a containment, so we'll build a real strong box around the pressure cooker. Mm. And then the containment is in another building called the tourist building and the reactor building. And then next to that building is the turbine building. So we've got like three or four different buildings here. We are finding in the turbine buildings, so we've got three different barriers before you ever get to the turbine building, concentrations of radioactive material on the order of a million becquerels, a million disintegrations per second in a liter. So think of a liter of Coke and, and think of a million sparkles of light every second. That's the water, not in the nuclear reactor, not in the nuclear reactor containment, not in the reactor building, but further away in the turbine building. So what concerns me is, um, uh, is worker exposure at this point. I, I, I think that, um, uh, and my mind has flipped on this, I thought eventually in 60 years or so they could dismantle these reactors. But I don't think that's fair to the workers at this point. The exposure these guys are going to get in the process of dismantling the reactors is going to be extraordinary. Now, a little bit of physics here. Um, the nuclear fuel is very hot in the first day and less hot the next day and less hot the next day. Um, it's still physically hot. You can still see steam coming off these buildings, but it's much less hot than it was after the accident. And about five years out, there's not a lot of heat coming off the nuclear fuel. So uh, five years out, a meltdown becomes impossible. So you have to cool. It's likely to be impossible now, but, but certainly five years out, it's, it's impossible. So you have to cool the nuclear reactor building, and the nuclear reactor was left of it, 
for about five years. But after that, you can turn off the pumps. Oh, so and, they're still pouring water over the molten fuel? Yes. Seawater. Yes. It's probably not molten, Helen. It's probably uh, a solid lump that's very hot. Ah. Um, but, um, yeah, they're still pouring water over it to the tune of, uh, uh, you know, tens of tons a day for each reactor. And that water is coming in, coming back out incredibly radioactive. And rather than pump it right back in, they, they are cleaning it with a, the mineralizer system that's very sophisticated, very expensive. But in the process now, they're creating hundreds of demineralizer resins. Think of like a Brita filter. Um, hundreds of those, but of course they're the size of a car, um, that are highly radioactive with cesium that's got a 300-year lifetime um, that they're putting out on a field behind the plant. And, and still, the concentration of radioactivity in the water is not going down because it's in direct contact with nuclear yeah. fuel. Yeah. So they've, they've contaminated the reactor, the, 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 the bottom of the containment, the torus, which is that donut-shaped thing, the uh, reactor building, which is outside that, the thing that blew up, the floor of that is contaminated, and the building next to it, the turbine hall, is uh, should be the least radioactive, and it's still a million disintegrations per second for every liter. So my my thought is now, um, considering the extent of this contamination, that it's not fair to the workers to have them go in and clean this. And I I think uh, um, if, if I were Tokyo Electric Management, a couple more years out after the cooling is completely done, I would consider filling up those those containment buildings with concrete and and walking away for 300 years you know obviously monitoring it but I don't think it's I don't think it's fair to the workers to um, to expose them to the extraordinary levels they'll receive if they um, if they were to uh, to try to uh, to turn that site back into a greenfield they couldn't turn it back into a greenfield that's ridiculous. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> yeah, you're right. Uh, of course, the big concern would be you've got to make sure you've got it all captured and it's not going down into the water table. But it, well, um, it will, it, and, and if you put concrete on it, you know it's going to keep going down into the water table, and you know it's going right. to keep contaminating the Pacific Ocean for the rest of time. Right. So the solution, there is no good solution. No, no there is absolutely no good. Is but the a- solution would be to bore holes underneath and constantly pull water out from under the building um, so oh. that whatever leaks down gets treated. So we're still back with these big demineralizers again. Uh, but I, I think, um, uh, to my mind, I, I couldn't, as a manager, uh, order you know a couple thousand workers to pick up extraordinarily high exposures um, to dismantle these plants at this point in time. So, Arnie, another question. Is there only one turbine building where the electricity is generated from a steam, or does each reactor building have its own turbine building? Each reactor building has its own turbine building. Well, which is the turbine building that's so radioactive with a million becquerels? Well, they all are. Unit 3 is worse. And it's interesting. Now, Unit 3 is contaminating Unit 4. What? And Unit 4, yes, they're connected. So we're finding water from Unit 3 leaking into Unit 4. And you know if it's leaking between the buildings, it's leaking into the ground next to the buildings, too. Yeah. Yeah, and the question is, how is it getting out? And uh, a good friend of mine is a, uh, was an electrical engineer for General Electric, and he told me how. He said, a containment is not a monolithic block. It's got pipes in it for the wires to go back and forth. Mm. Electrical wires go in and out. Mm. And the wires are caulked with a rubber. Well, the rubber wasn't designed to handle this radiation level. Mm. The rubber wasn't designed to handle the heat. And the rubber wasn't designed to handle salt water. So all of these electrical penetrations between the reactor and all the other buildings on the site are leaking and are causing this radioactive material to move everywhere on the site. Oh, <laughs> I'm a little bit speechless. Okay, my next question. So it, the three turbine buildings each are exhibiting a million becquerels per litre 
of radiation. Is that correct? The worst one is Unit 3 is a million, and the others are around that. It, okay. I, I don't know precisely, but they're huge numbers. And, yeah. you know, certainly not something you would send somebody in to voluntarily uh, you know, scrub so the wall. So that indicates if in the turbine buildings, which is three buildings distant from the reactor itself, um, therefore you would extrapolate back and say that if the radiation is as high as that in the turbine buildings, it will be higher in each of the other buildings to the reactor itself, right? So you extrapolate. That's exactly right. Yeah. That's exactly right. You know, and, and if they dismantle this building, they still have the same radioactive material. Now they've got to move it someplace where it's clean. That doesn't make a lot of sense. So it very well may be that the Japanese will say, okay, we we made a huge mistake, uh, and, but we're going to use the Fukushima site as the ultimate waste repository for everything we're finding on the site. Right. Rather than on contaminate the another location, yeah. this one, let's just call it a sacrifice and walk away. Yeah, but then you're sacrificing the Pacific Ocean and the people who eat the fish from the ocean and the people on, on the west coast of America and people in Australia because the fish swim everywhere. I mean, you are sacrificing the Pacific by leaving this stuff there for the rest of time, which will leak and drain consistently into the Pacific. You're You're right. It needs to be constantly pumped out for 100, 200 years until they want to go back in and dismantle it. Yeah, but, you know, um, what, are, what are our descendants going to say? There are three generations per 100 years. So say for the next 300 years, that's nine generations of people. How will they be thinking? <laughs> will they be doing it? Will they want to do it? Will they have the, will they have the apparatus to do it and the knowledge and, you know, I mean, we yep. are assuming an awful lot, Arnie. We're assuming people nine generations from now think the same way that we think. I know. We, and we also think that society will be functioning 300 yeah. years at at least as high a level as we are. Um, and, um, uh, and we also have to figure, where's all this money going to come from? Um, I don't see the international community saying, here, Japan, here's a half a trillion dollars. It's coming out of the Japanese Treasury. Now, they're not admitting that. The Japanese are not admitting that their Treasury is going to take a, a half a trillion dollar hit. You know, that right now it's uh, $10 trillion this month or $10 trillion this quarter and $10 trillion another half a year out. But nobody's looking at the big picture and realizing that, I'm, I'm sorry, $10 billion, $10 billion, $10 billion. Mm. Nobody's looking at the big picture here and saying, when you add up all of this for 50 or 60 or 100 years, you're looking at a half a trillion dollar expenditure. Um, Japan's population is aging and declining, so they're carrying a huge burden on an aging, uh, shrinking population. It's a, uh, it's not a, it's not a great situation, that's for sure. Well, let alone the number of malignancies and diseases that are going to accrue from this accident. I mean, we know that. The data from Chernobyl shows that within the first 25 years, up to a million people have died. And we're going to talk about the next 300 years or 600 years as long as cesium remains radioactive. But there are other elements that remain radioactive for hundreds, thousands, if not millions of years. And they're similarly in the mix, as is the cesium. And so if you and, and you have said yourself, Arnie Gunderson, that you think the Fukushima releases of radiation were 2.5 to 3 times greater than those from Chernobyl. So, And the Japanese population is much more densely situated than people living around Chernobyl. So if you multiply 1 million in the first 25 years by 2.5 or 3 from your data, you could end up with a figure like 3 million people dying in the first 25 years in Japan. Oh, well, I'm at a million. I am, uh, um, you know, feel the nuclear industry uh, is, is obviously throwing barbs at my number, but they're claiming that maybe 100 people will die of cancer. Oh, that's from the ridiculous. But uh, I use Steve Wing's data from Three Mile Island, and, uh, you know, he shows pretty clearly that 10,000 people died of cancer from Three Mile Island. And, of course, we know a million at, at, uh, at Chernobyl. So it, it seems to me, based on the fact that we had larger releases after Fukushima in a higher population zone, 
uh, that um, that a million people is certainly uh, credible. The the difference around Chernobyl is that on one side of Fukushima you have water, where mm. Chernobyl was land all the way around. But um, um, it's uh, you know, but the 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 industry knows that the uh, um, there there will be Japan's got a population of 140 million, and if you um, and about about a third die of cancer. So you're looking at roughly 40 or 50 million over that time period will normally die of cancer. So if I'm right and there's a million people, that's only a 2% increase. It, and so it will be extraordinarily hard to measure if you're not looking for it. Oh, but and people I think what, will be, they will be doing epidemiological studies. And I think that you're underestimating that number because do you still stand by your date of that 2.5 to 3 times more radiation escape from Fukushima than Chernobyl? Well, that was uh, certainly, uh, I'm certain of that for yeah. the noble gases. Yeah. For the xenon and krypton, um, there's, uh, there's measured data um, in the northwest quadrant for the first week of the accident yeah. where every cubic meter, you know, 3 feet by 3 feet by 3 feet of air was um, was a thousand becquerels per um, a thousand disintegrations per second for every cubic meter up that way. Now that's got to be causing you know lung cancers and and uh, whole body exposures that the industry is not willing to uh, to address. The other thing is that they found that um, um, apparently on March sixteenth, uh, um, Unit Two. Um, had an internal explosion. It looks fine. If you look at Unit 2 from the outside, Mm. it doesn't look bad at all. But it cracked the containment at the same time the operators had all of the vents open in the nuclear reactor. And a huge cloud of radiation was released on the 16th, and the wind was blowing toward Tokyo. Now, there's there's not a lot of radiation monitors that early in the accident. You know, there's chaos within Japan and Tokyo Electric. And yet, no one is re- really willing to say, oh, my God, what was the exposure in Tokyo on March 15th, 16th, 17th? Um, there's not a lot of good data. And what data there is, uh, the Japanese are consistently downplaying. They're, they're underestimating the, um, the exposure. But, you know, I was in Tokyo back in, back in February, and I found on the ground uh, 7,000 disintegrations per second in every kilogram of soil. That, that would qualify as radioactive waste in the States. And, uh, and the Japanese government is saying, you know, don't worry, be happy. Um, uh, smile. Business, business as usual, right? They say smile. <laughs> okay, so we've, we've established, and so the point I was making by the number of diseases, not just cancer and leukemia, but diabetes, premature aging in children, increased incidence of cataracts, increased incidence of severe congenital anomalies that we've seen in Chernobyl. And in fact, today I'm going to interview a pediatrician who is a specialist in teratology, meaning damage to fetuses, um, about the, the incidence of congenital anomalies around Chernobyl, which is still ongoing, incidentally. We'll be seeing that around Fukushima for sure in the population. So we're not just talking about malignancies. There are many other diseases related to radiation exposure. And so what I wanted to point out as a physician is that the expense to the Japanese government and the people in general to care for these people and try and treat them is going to be enormous. And that is not being factored into the accident at the moment. No, I think you're absolutely right. And on top of that is the is the generational genetic damage. Uh, oh, yeah. There was a study out just last week about the, the radioactive butterfly uh, damage. And uh, um, the, the, what they're finding is that in successive generations, the genetic damage is getting worse, uh, so that three generations of butterflies seem to have more genetic damage than the first, the first generation. So, um, um, you know, there's obviously a lot more study needs to be done here, but... Um, we're looking at, uh, you know, a damaged gene pool uh, that won't manifest itself in 10 years or 20 years. It will manifest itself in a generation or two. That, that's the most serious part of the accident and of anything nuclear. It's called genomic progression, genomic progression. Um, now, I've got some other questions, Arnie. You said earlier in the accident that 
that a lot of hydrogen was building up in the buildings units one, two and three and they were injecting nitrogen into the buildings to dilute the hydrogen so there would not be a hydrogen explosion. Is the hydrogen still building up? Um, well, they, and they failed. I mean, unit one, two, three and four um, all blew up uh, from hydrogen explosions. So, um, they may have had different causes and things like that. And I believe Unit 3 started as a hydrogen explosion, but then became something called a prompt moderated criticality, which is worse. Um, uh, interesting, uh, I'm sorry, I'm taking a little bit off topic here, but um, there was a Japanese study which is now calling the explosion in Unit 3 a detonation, not a deflagration. And that has to do with the speed at which the wave front travels. And there's no containment in the world that can withstand a detonation shockwave. So um, that's something the nuclear industry doesn't want to address. But uh, we, we now have um, a TMI had an explosion, but it was a deflagration. Unit 1 at Fukushima had an explosion, but it was a deflagration, a slower-moving shockwave. But Unit 3's explosion now, you know, by authorities other than Arnie Gunderson, are now calling it a detonation. Meaning and that? Well, that means that the shock wave travels faster than the speed of sound, and it cracks the concrete or yeah, the but steel. What's, but what caused the explosion? You were saying it probably wasn't a hydrogen explosion. Was it a nuclear excursion? Well, it's not, I, I think it's something called a prompt moderated criticality. What's that? It, it, it's not a nuclear bomb. A nuclear bomb, the... the rate at which the explosion grows is it doubles every millionth of a second. Um, a prompt moderated criticality doubles every thousandth of a second. You know, it's still a blink of an eye, but uh, the, the, what you saw at, uh, at Unit um, 3 um, was a, uh, a slower doubling than a nuclear bomb, but much faster than uh, nuclear reactors are designed to so handle. So was it a moderated nuclear explosion? The moderate, it means that the neutrons left the, the uranium atom uh, very fast, but then they, they bumped into water and they attenuated and became what we call thermal neutrons. So we're really getting into a lot of nuclear physics here, but the, the net effect is that the growth rate of the explosion in Unit 3 was was moderated, which means it doubled every thousandth of a second. But it was a so nuclear in, in, explosion. It wasn't not hydrogen, but nuclear. Would you say that? In my opinion, it was a prompt moderated criticality. Which I'm not going to call it a nuclear explosion because that, that would be a prompt unmoderated criticality. And, and I don't believe that happened. Uh, you know, but it the, was the related bomb, to the nuclear fuel. Yes. But it was it, the rate at which it grew. I won't call it a nuclear explosion. Okay, you're being very careful, Arnie. 